Publish or perish. That's one of the axioms of academia. And if you're a grad student or if you've recently finished your doctorate in archaeology, you're probably on the job market or at least worrying about your future in that job market. I can tell you that one of the most impactful criteria to your success in that market, especially if you aspire to an academic job, will be publications. You absolutely should be publishing and making good decisions about what, how, and where to publish. Here are some of my tips on how to choose where to send your article based largely on my own experiences of both publishing papers and serving on journals' editorial boards. Of all the things you want to do to succeed, including getting field experience and teaching experience, publishing is probably the most important for young academic archaeologists. It can't hurt to get into more senior positions in CRM or heritage management either. You may have a PhD thesis finished or well underway, but what publishing strategy should you pursue to get your research noticed? Here are some of the things you should consider. Should you be publishing in books or in peer-reviewed journals? Some archaeologists opt to publish their whole thesis as a monograph, but that's not the most common option, and I don't think it's generally the best one for your career either. One of the things you'll probably experience soon and often is that some friend or colleague will approach you and ask you to contribute to a conference session with the idea that the session organizer will shop the conference papers around some publishers to get them out as an edited volume. This isn't always a bad idea, and sometimes it's hard to say no, but I strongly recommend that you decline politely unless it's for a volume in honor of your supervisor or some such. Here's why. First, these edited volumes typically take years to get published. Even when you've submitted your own paper by the editor's deadline, other contributors will be late, often very late, and they'll bog the whole process down. I've had some papers that I submitted on time, but waited more than 10 years to reach publication. One never appeared at all. Usually I simply drop them from the submitted or in press section of my CV after four or five years of the editor's inaction. Say what you will about journal turnaround times, they're always much faster than your typical edited volume. Second, unless it's a pretty remarkable volume with renowned editors and published by a premier publisher, the odds are that almost nobody will read it, let alone cite it. In fact, some of the citation indices won't even pick up on it. I know of very few edited volumes in archaeology that people constantly cite and recite, mainly because the papers in them were groundbreaking in some way. The rest simply fade into obscurity. Instead, you're much better off to submit your work to a peer-reviewed journal. Some of these will reach large audiences, increasing the visibility of the research papers in them and their chances that someone will cite them. For the rest of this video, I'll focus on journals. Once you decide to submit your research as one or more articles, you next have to choose where to send it. There are literally hundreds of journals to choose from. One aspect of this choice is understanding your audience. Who is most likely to be interested in your research? Whom are you trying to reach? And what journals do they typically read? This depends on the nature of your research and particular aspects of that research. Some of your research results might have broad implications that will interest a broad range of archaeologists and even some non-archaeologists. Other parts of your research might be detailed and in-depth, but likely of interest only to archaeologists who do much the same kind of archaeology that you do. A paper that is or resembles an excavation report, for example, will be suitable for a local or regional archaeology journal, but probably not for any of the highly ranked journals that I'm about to discuss. For those, you need a paper that has at least somewhat more general implications, since the editors are trying to attract broad audiences, at least within some sector of archaeology. For some kinds of archaeology, you'll want to focus on journals that specialize in classical archaeology, such as American Journal of Archaeology, Hesperia, or Journal of Roman Archaeology. But there are also journals that cover classics more broadly, including both archaeological and text-based research such as Journal of Hellenic Studies, Journal of Roman Studies, and Classical Review. Or perhaps your research is most appropriate for a journal that specializes in historical archaeology, such as Historical Archaeology or International Journal of Historical Archaeology, or journals in related topics of post-medieval archaeology or industrial archaeology. There are also journals that cater to European medieval archaeology, as well as ones that specialize geographically in the archaeology of Europe, or the Mediterranean, or Africa, or Asia and the Middle East, or Canada, or Latin America. 
There are also journals that specialize in material, methodological, or theoretical aspects of archaeology, such as environmental archaeology or geoarchaeology, and archaeological applications from the physical sciences, such as radiocarbon or archaeometry. There are also some non-archaeological journals, like Economic Botany or Quaternary Science Reviews, that publish relevant archaeology papers. One of these could be appropriate if your paper has to do with domestication of plants, ancient plant use, geoarchaeology, or archaeological aspects of ancient climate changes, for example. Finally, there are even some journals that have very broad scientific coverage, including at least some kinds of archaeological topics. Among these are Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, Plus One, and even, in rare cases, Science or Nature. In addition to journal scope and focus, you should consider its reputation and reach. To some extent, this will be pretty obvious. You know what journals people in your corner of archaeology tend to value most, and you can always ask around to find out which journals your mentors and colleagues consider premier ones. But there are also lots of rankings that you can look up to find out what the top journals are. These rankings vary in their methodology, but tend to focus on things like the average number of times their articles get cited, typically called an impact factor. Most of them make use of calculations that come from three basic sources, Web of Science, Scopus, and Google Scholar. Obviously, if one of your goals is for your research to have impact in your field, it's a good sign if people are citing you. Check the references at the end of this video if you want to learn more about the differences between these scores. Even though these rankings are based mostly on the same data and methodologies, they vary in their results, in part because of the selection of journals they include in their database. They also vary from year to year or according to user focus. One commonly used one is Schimago Journal Rank. In this one, currently, the top journal in archaeology is Journal of Archaeological Research, followed closely by a non-archaeological one, Quaternary Science Reviews. The ranking continues through American Antiquity, Journal of World Prehistory, Journal of Archaeological Science, and Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory. Oddly, the next one it ranks is Journal of Agrarian Change, a journal that's focused on the political economy of agricultural communities. Although it does accept papers on historical aspects of this focus, it's mostly on contemporary cases and only rarely includes archaeology. In fact, I've never heard of anybody submitting an article to, the, to this journal. And I'd skip over this one unless your topic is pretty close to agrarian history. Schimago rounds out its top ten with Antiquity, Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences, and Journal of Anthropological Archaeology. OOIR, the Observatory of International Research, has a somewhat different ranking. Its top three by average citation, with closely similar averages, are Journal of Cultural Heritage, not exactly an archaeological journal, uh, Journal of Archaeological Research, and Journal of Archaeological Science. Its remaining top ten include Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences, Journal of Archaeological Method and Theory, Journal of Field Archaeology, Journal of Anthropological Archaeology, the more specialized Archaeological Prospection, World Archaeology, and Archaeometry. OOIR also ranks by impact factor using the impact factor of the Web of Science which is a two-year average of citations. This provides somewhat different results with Journal of Archaeological Research coming out on top. Researchify uses multiple scores, including ones I've already mentioned, to come up with yet another ranking, with radiocarbon coming out on top, which strikes me as a bit surprising. One of the most widely used rankings is that of Google Scholar. It depends on the H5 index, which is the H index for the past five years. The H-index itself is the number of articles that have been cited at least that number of times. For example, if there are 22 articles that have been cited at least 22 times, the H-index is 22. The H-5 index just restricts this to the last five years. And for journal rankings, it's referring to the number of articles in the journal rather than the number of articles for a particular author. Google Scholar also uses the H-5 median. This simply takes into account that many of the articles included in the H5 could have been cited a lot more than the minimum. For example, of an H5 of 22, the median number of citations for those 22 articles could be a lot higher, perhaps 35 or even 40. In the current ranking, the top genuinely archaeological journal by H5 is the Journal of Archaeological Science, with H5 of 38 and H5 median of 45.
Although you don't need to take all these, in some cases quite minor, differences in impact factor too seriously, it's worthwhile at least to check to see if the journal to which you're thinking of submitting your paper is in the top 20 or so of at least some of these rankings. The important thing is aim high. Often, newer scholars are nervous about sending their work to the best journals and may up essentially wasting a really good paper on a journal that hardly anyone reads. I made this mistake myself early in my career. Sometimes I was reaching the right audience, but too small an audience, failing to realize that there was a much bigger audience that would also have been interested in my work. So don't make that same mistake and aim high. Try submitting to the big scary journals. The worst case scenario, you'll get rejected, but you'll also get the benefit of constructive peer reviewer comments that will help you craft a stronger paper that you can send to the next journal on your list. Sometimes the editor or reviewers will point out that your paper is too specialized for that journal and they'll probably suggest one or two that they think would be more appropriate. Take advantage of their advice. Another factor you'll want to consider is turnaround time. Especially when you're in the early days of your career, you can't afford to wait around for several years for a paper to come out. You'll want several articles to appear within your first two years on the job market. And that's not the only reason to worry about turnaround. If your publisher is really slow, it's conceivable that your paper could become outdated by new discoveries or even upstaged by someone else who's working along very similar lines. So you need to submit to journals that have a disciplined peer review process and little to no backlog of articles. To find that out, you'll want to ask more senior colleagues or your supervisor if they know what the turnaround times are for the journals you're considering. But you can also look online or in a university library to see what's the latest issue to appear. If the most recent volume published is a 2020 volume, for example, that's a real warning sign that the journal is way behind schedule and may have a backlog that would delay your own paper. At the moment, most of the journals that we've been talking about publish print editions but make digital versions of the papers available online soon after they're accepted. But there are also journals now that are online only. There's still a tendency to favor the more traditional format, but the online publications are probably the future. In any case, there's nothing wrong with them, and some, despite being pretty new, are beginning to have pretty good impact factors. For example, Open Archaeology, with a two-year impact factor around 0.8, is tied with Historical Archaeology and only slightly below Latin American Antiquity, and not much below Journal of Social Archaeology. Internet Archaeology is another digital-only option. It's innovative in that it tries to take full advantage of the online format by encouraging articles that include things like video, audio, animation, and interactive maps. It also has the advantage, for those who are concerned about one of my next topics, that it's non-profit. Now that digital publication is the norm, even for the more traditional publishers that have print editions, a big issue is open access. In fact, there is a strong push these days to make research results openly available, in part to make it accessible to, in countries where many researchers would not be able to afford to pay for it, the so-called paywall problem. Many funding institutions in the United States, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and the United Kingdom now require published peer-reviewed research that they fund to be open access, often within a year or six months. This is called an open access mandate and universities and grant holders in these countries have to budget for the costs of making their research open access, often through fees that I'm going to discuss in a few minutes. Aside from complying with such mandates, there are advantages to open access. One is that your article is likely to have much larger reach, as anyone can find it and download it for free from the internet. In fact, probably a lot of non-archaeologists will come across it as well, which potentially allows your paper to have impacts in other fields and even outside academia. This greater reach also increases the chances that you'll be cited and that your research will be mentioned in news and popular media. Finally, in most cases, you retain the copyright to your article when it's open access. In the older model, publishers held the copyright and your own rights to use or distribute the paper were restricted. However, while open access removes paywalls, it also erects another kind of wall because full and immediate open access usually called gold open access, typically requires authors to pay fees called article processing charges or APCs unless their home institution has an arrangement with the publisher to cover these charges for all of their authors. 
APCs essentially compensate the publisher for the income they lose by bringing down the paywall, shifting the cost from readers to content providers, and they vary a lot from journal to journal. However, you can usually count on them costing anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 in U.S. currency, with the most prestigious or high-impact journals being at the upper end of this distribution. You don't need to pay this up front when you submit your paper, but you do need to pay it after it's accepted and before it appears online. Needless to say, if you're a struggling grad student or underemployed new PhD, you probably can't afford to shell out $3,000 to have your article published. See if you can do something like piggyback onto your supervisor's access to a university APC contract, uh, perhaps by co-authoring the paper with your, co your supervisor. Otherwise, you may have to settle for a journal that has somewhat less impact, uh, but a lower APC, or for a lesser version of open access than the gold version that only makes your article freely uh, accessible after an embargo period of a year or two. The advantage of gold open access is that your article becomes available to everyone immediately after its acceptance, with no wait period or embargo. I should mention that some journals also have diamond open access. This makes your article freely available without having to pay an APC. However, the current indexing services like Scopus and Web of Science seem to underrepresent these diamond articles quite a bit. One can only hope that this inequity will be corrected before too long. These paywalls and APCs bring up another issue that might influence your choice of journal for your work. Publishing is a huge, multinational, and profit-making business, and the big publishers rake in huge profits, largely on the free or nearly free labor of authors, editors, and peer reviewers. For example, in 2022, Elsevier's parent company had profits around $3 billion in U.S. dollars, with much of the increase in their profits apparently due to the shift to open access models. The major academic publishers, such as Elsevier, Springer, Taylor & Francis, Sage & Wiley, are highly profitable, but at least recognize the ethical dilemma here and sometimes make some attempts, insufficient though they may be, to compensate the people that they're essentially exploiting. For example, they archive your paper, they may help to market your paper or give you free access to their own citation services if you do peer review for them. It's still rather inequitable, leading some scholars to boycott these big publishers altogether. For most of us, however, the need to get our research out there and improve our career options leads us, reluctantly or not, to accede to the system and send our papers to these big publishers. But there are some open access publishing houses that are so exploitive that they're called predatory publishers. These are for-profit companies that lure authors to publish with them with promises of extremely short turnarounds or even guaranteed acceptance so they can collect large APCs. They conduct little or no serious peer review or editing of your manuscript, and the overall quality of the articles in the journals they publish, as you might expect, are pretty low. Most scholars, even if they can find your paper, will not take it more seriously than a book from a vanity press so your publication efforts could actually harm your career instead of helping it. Often, you'll encounter these publishers because they email you and try to recruit you either to submit a manuscript or to serve as guest editor or member of their editorial board. That in itself is kind of suspicious. A librarian named Jeffrey Beal, who actually coined the term predatory publisher, used to provide a listing of journals and publishers he believed might be predatory on a website. In 2017, he suddenly took it all down, perhaps to avoid legal risks or because he couldn't back it up with hard evidence. You can still find archived versions of his list online, but there are other things you can check to escape falling prey to the most highly exploitive companies. If you've never read anything in the journal, or even heard of it, that's a warning sign. You can feel a lot safer with journals that are most familiar, and that have been around, at least in print form, for many decades. If it's up to volume 60 or 70, that's a pretty good sign that it's reliable. Another telltale sign is that some of the predatory journals intentionally use a name that's suspiciously similar to that of a well-respected journal. As predatory publishers don't do serious peer review, you should see what a publisher's website says about their review process. We all like peer review to be reasonably quick, but if it guarantees that you'll get a decision on your paper in just a week or two, it's a sign that there's no real peer review at all. You should also check to see if the publisher claims to index its papers in the usual directories, like Clarivate, which operates the Web of Science database, the Arts and Humanities Citation Index, and Scopus, an index owned by Elsevier. 
and archiving services like portico.org. You can then check the directory to make sure that the claim is an honest one. You can also check to see if the journal is a member of the Committee on Publishing Ethics, or COPE. I'll provide a link to that site below. Finally, you can also check to see if the journal is in the directory of open access journals. Since 2014, this directory has had strict criteria for including journals in its list. Predatory journals may claim to be in the DOOJ, but you can easily check to see if the claim is false. Again, I'll provide a link to that below. Another thing you have to think about is co-authorship. From the perspective of a job candidate, it's good to have published papers on which you're either the sole author or the first author. But co-authorship is not a bad thing. As, as you pursue your publication career, it's good to have a mix with some sole author papers, some where you're the first of several authors, and others where you might be in the middle of a bunch of authors. Later, when you're running your own lab or project, it's conventional to be the last author on some of your multi-authored papers. But early in your career, first and sole authorship should be your main focus. It's pretty obvious why sole authorship is good. It's very clear that the research in the paper is your own work, and the content of the article immediately tells grant reviewers and hiring committees what your skills and capabilities are. But what's so great about co-authoring? Actually, several things. First, when writing of the paper is a genuine partnership, and not just splicing together uh, several mini-reports, the result is more than the sum of its parts. It's really a strong and impressive research contribution. Second, partnering with other scholars allows you to address bigger research questions, ones that require expertise that might not be in your wheelhouse. Third, co-authorship demonstrates to a hiring committee that you're probably a good team player, willing and able to collaborate. However, you'll somehow want to signal to that hiring committee that your contribution to a multi-authored paper was a substantive one. You didn't just have your name added on. Fourth, in some cases, co-authorship might give you access to institutional coverage of the APC for open access, as long as one of your co-authors is at an institution that offers that. And fifth, it builds your network, especially if you ensure that you're not drawing on the same people as co-authors all the time. Having a large and strong network of colleagues has a number of obvious advantages, but, there, but there's also one that you may not realize. All these co-authors help to elevate your own citations because every time they cite themselves, they're also citing you. That might seem a bit cynical, but it's also a benefit and you might as well take advantage of it. When you have only one or two co-authors with whom you work somewhat regularly, you can vary the author order on the basis of who took the lead on some aspect of the research, or just somewhat randomly so that everyone gets a chance to be first author, and your research partnership remains amicable. When there are lots of co-authors, it's common for the author order to be alphabetical, or perhaps alphabetical after the first author or before the last author. In this last case, the first author would normally indicate the lead or corresponding author, and the last one the project or lab director. My general takeaway is that you should develop a good mix of single author and multi author publications. Finally, your paper's published. Congratulations! Now you should do some things to make sure it's visible. I've already talked about open access, and gold open access is an excellent way to make sure your article is widely available right from the start. But you should not depend only on your publisher to market your paper. List it on academic versions of what are effectively social media, like ResearchGate or Academia. If your contract with your publisher allows it, offer full text of your article through these venues. Usually, you can even preview your article by offering the uncorrected proof before the final version comes out. You can also use non-academic kinds of social media, like Facebook or LinkedIn, to call attention to your article's appearance. And if you really want to make sure you reach a particular audience of experts in your field, you can always send them a PDF or a link to the article. A pretty obvious group consists of all the people you cited in your paper, and you can just email them. I hope you find these tips of some help as you make the important decisions of where and how to present your research through publications. I've included some references at the end of the video to help you explore some of the topics I've mentioned in more detail, and also some links below to sites you might find useful. I plan to do some other videos related to this topic, including one on the peer review process, uh, on how you can market your research and increase its visibility, on publishing monographs on bigger projects, and possibly one on how citation indices work. If you want to receive alerts when these future videos come out, please click on the subscribe button down below. Thank you, and stay safe.